What I'd like to do is to very briefly review some of the observations of auroral arcs, which is certainly one of the most dramatic manifestations of the coupling between the ionosphere and the magnetosphere, and then go through a, a very brief discussion of some of the theoretical ideas that have been proposed, but by no means all. I'd now like to turn to the plasma turbulence, which is associated with arcs, and I'm particularly going to just focus on that br those branches of plasma turbulence that we think, for theoretical reasons, have to do with the flow of field aligned currents. On the same rocket shot that, uh, from Bering and, and Moser and Kelly, they also had an AC electric field sensitivity. And this is a spectrum which, they took, which was taken just as they entered the arc for the first time. You can see there is a sharp peak in the electric field spectrum, somewhere between 30 and 50 hertz, which corresponds roughly to the local oxygen cyclotron frequency. And the authors speculated that this is evidence for the excitation of the electrostatic ion cyclotron instability, which had been predicted theoretically by Kendall and Kennel some years ago. And at the same time, or very closely there near to this, they measured a strong field aligned flow of heated ionospheric ions. And they argued that this was essentially confirmed the theory, nonlinear theory of the electrostatic ion cyclotron instability proposed by Paul Modesso and his colleagues at NRL that that instability ought to heat low energy ions and they ought to essentially expand thermally along the magnetic field and saturate out the instability by essentially heating the process. Another type of emission that's seen in aurora and also seen essentially all around the polar cap is VLF auroral hiss. This is a slide taken from Burnett and Frank again in June 5 measurement. These are the electron measurements on the night side, inverted V regions, day side, sort of just ordinary polar cusp type precipitation. And on the top, you see the 7 kilohertz channel out and all the way up to 70 kilohertz, strong excitation of low frequency or reasonably low frequency waves. Waves are primarily electrostatic. Um, the spectrum generally peaks at the lower hybrid frequency, at the uh, lower hybrid frequency corresponding to the altitude of the satellite but extends all the way up to 100 kilohertz and perhaps even merging beyond with higher frequency noise spectra. If you go a little bit farther out in the magnetosphere, we've come to a region which has been very ill explored and will probably remain so until, if and until and when, the electrodynamic explorer mission is, gets off the ground. That is figuring out, following the flow of field aligned currents further out into the magnetosphere. Finally, there, of course, is the dramatic rediscovery by Don Burnett of kilometric radiation. So if you alluded to this morning, here's a spectrum taken from one of Burnett's papers. Kilometrics, rural kilometric radiation peaks somewhere between 100 and megahertz in frequency, very, uh, various other types of radiation that you can detect. Um, has peak powers the order of 10 to the minus 15 to 10 to the minus 14 watts per meter squared per hertz. At those types of power levels, the, rate, the total amount of radiation emitted by a, hem half a, a hemisphere would correspond to something like 10 to the ninth watts. And 10 to the ninth watts is just about what the average decimetric radiation is from Jupiter which is, of course, the eomodulated radiation. And it puts the Earth in roughly the same power class as Jupiter, as a radio emitter. Now, this whole problem of field-aligned beams and their radiation is, of course, not just limited to the Earth. There are now four well-known and one less well-known object in the solar system which emits electromagnetic radiation by probably essentially the same process. There are, of course, the type 3 radio bursts from the Sun, Decometric radiation from Jupiter, hectometric radiation from Saturn, and Brown has now recently, rumors have it, has seen 500 kilohertz radiation from Uranus. All of these spectra have a fairly broad range in frequencies, which indicate that the, the beams of particles that are making the radiation must have traversed a fairly large distance to have passed through a sufficient range of plasma parameters to account for the excitation of all the frequencies. So these beams 
must persist for a long time. And in particular, the case of the type 3 radio bursts, they've been seen all the way from the solar corona out to, in the past, 1 AU. So the solving the kilometric problem is, I think, one of very general significance for plasma physics in the solar system. And of course, one needn't stop there. Electromagnetic radiation processes exist throughout all of astrophysics. And we certainly expect from our experience with the Earth that field-aligned currents should also exist in many astrophysical objects. Those field-aligned currents may well take part in much of the radiation that we see from astrophysical objects. I think, however, that theory alone will not provide the complete answer to the kilometric problem. It's going to be necessary to go out and make observations in the, no in the generation region for an in-situ spacecraft. And that I think, therefore, most theorists are looking rather forward to the Electrodynamics Explorer mission, which hopefully will fly right through that region with sufficient plasma detectors and wave detectors to tell us really what's going on. Well, with that, I'll stop. Okay. Uh, first, I have to apologize in advance if I get something wrong. I have a new computer, and it uh, it keeps doing things that I didn't think it was going to do. So, <laughs> uh, the other thing is that I'm armed only with a laser pointer. I noticed that uh, Coroniti had something that he could hit people over the head with. <laughs> so, you've all seen my uh, comment on the white shirt and tie. This is roughly at the time of the uh, 1974 conference, and this is roughly today. And I think it's amazing how little Ferd has changed, uh, including uh, the white shirt, tie, usually jacket. <laughs> OK, now this is what I don't know about. Next, I see I do this. Mm. OK. So I was, uh, everybody has talked about their personal connection with the people they've talked about. And I, too, uh, had the good fortune of being at UCLA uh, from the very beginning uh, with a bunch of really great people, uh, Ferd being the person we're talking about today. But there was also Charlie Kennel, Richard Thorne. Paul Coleman, whose name doesn't come up nearly often enough because he really did a lot of the very important work in our field. Bob McFerrin, Mike Cornwall, Bob Holzer, Joe Kaplan, many of you may not know that name, but he, he was very instrumental in getting the first international geophysical year going in the late 50s. And he never hesitated to tell you about me and Faraday and mostly me. Uh, George Sisko, Tom Farley, Chris Russell, lots of students, uh, many of whom are here today. And it was an exciting scene, and Ferd was always very central. Uh, so uh, one of the things about Ferd was the breadth of his interests. Uh, I think of him as a theorist, but he's a theorist who's deeply interested in data and really focused his work on trying to understand a, a lot of the things that were seen in the data. And I'll give only a few examples. The SAR arc generation, he was involved in that work with Richard. Uh, plasma sheet stability, ion tearing mode, bursty bulk flows, um, explosive reconnection, role of the ionosphere in governing magnetospheric convection, related work on the auroral electrojet, and he was an early, uh, per, er, early on appreciated the value of numerical calculations and still today is very much involved with uh, Phil Pritchett in simulating fundamental processes in space plasmas. And the other thing that I think really characterized Ferd was his interest in taking the ideas that he got by studying near-Earth space and uh, using it for thinking about things throughout the solar system. So those were um, very important. I can't remember where he wrote it, possibly in the paper on explosive reconnections. Uh, but one of my favorite comments of Ferd 
has to do with MHD versus kinetic theory. And he pointed out that even if you're focusing on the small scale, you should never forget that MHD sets the boundary conditions. And so when we hear people sort of touting their latest uh, simulations uh, and sort of downplaying the others, uh, they're all important, and I think Ray is going to talk a little bit about how you can couple them, which is certainly of great interest. Um, so uh, I thought pulled out one nice example of a place where I thought that Ferd uh, did a very good job with Charlie Kennel in taking ideas that had been explored in Earth's environment and applying it to an astrophysical problem. And it had to do with looking at the fact that there's an outflow, a pole of, of an outflowing pulsar wind. It's relativistic, so the equations get much more complicated. But it's terminated by a strong MHD shock that decelerates the flow. And so there's an end to the outflow and uh, some of the phenomena that are seen in the vicinity of the crab pulsar can be understood in terms of dynamics that we had explored at Earth. So, uh, he's a great teacher, and I pulled from the web some of the comments, and I'm going to read them in case people in the back of the room can't read them. By far the best professor I've had at UCLA, never had I looked forward to lecture before. Each lecture was organized, had almost no mistakes and derivations, and he stopped and made people ask questions until everyone was on the same page. I think all of us would be happy to get that kind of review. Don't pass up the chance to take this professor. He will leave you with some very powerful solving tools, as he calls it, and you will experience one of the best professors on UCLA. This is the kind of professor you came here for. And finally, he's also a really nice guy with a cute sense of humor. One of my friends said once, wow, Karaniti would make such a cool grandpa. <laughs> Basically, don't be afraid of him because his lecture is at 8 a.m or because it's the last Physics 6 class open during your first pass, he's a great professor. And since you're most likely a life science major taking the 6 series, you shouldn't be stressing too much about the material anyways. <laughs> and so, uh, on the topic of this meeting, can the ionosphere regulate magnetospheric convection? I think that was the um, part of Ferd's work that gave me the greatest angst because he kept talking about line tying and I didn't understand about ionospheres and I had no idea what he was talking about but he did uh, ad address the problem of how ionospheric conductivity controls things like the convective return of magnetic flux very important problem, and I think I understand what he meant in this paper, 1973 paper, finally. So, I think I have one more slide. So, uh, just sort of a summary of some of the things that he's done. He uh, used the strong theoretical tools to help us understand uh, and uh, gain insight into measurements. He reached beyond Earth to gain knowledge by studying other solar system magnetospheres. And I think uh, some of the things that I know about Jupiter still go back to papers he wrote in the early 1970s that were published in one of Billy McCormick's books. He used uh, tools honed by his deep understanding of solar system magnetospheres to study astrophysical problems, and he's particularly interested in those today. And he's a remarkable expositor. He stands up without notes, proceeds to derive derivation, uh, equations as if he were writing a laundry list, and communicates ideas with clarity and very grammatically. 
He's one of those people whose word one almost takes automatically as gospel. So that's my comments on Ferd.